All right. So, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for today's event. My name is Adriana Bankston. I'm the CEO and managing publisher for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. And I want to provide a brief background on the journal for those that may not be familiar before we go into the panel discussion. So JSPG is an internationally recognized open access and peer reviewed publication. We were established 10 years ago by senior leaders and young scholars in science and technology policy. And our mission is to catalyze the engagement of students and early career researchers in science policy and governance, um, as well as debates through policy research and writing. We publish policy papers from students, postdocs, policy fellows, and early career researchers in science policy. And we also bolster their research and writing credentials in policy and encourage them to engage in debate, uh, debate and discourse at all levels of government. We publish a number of formats, uh, as you can see here, OPEDs, technology assessments, policy memos, um, policy analyses, white papers, book reviews, workshop proceedings, and other research articles. We cover a number of areas in science policy, as you can see here, really trying to cover every corner of science and technology policy, and you can find out more information on our website. In addition, we promote the publications through our global mailing list and events such as workshops, webinars, and a podcast where we interview published authors. And you can follow us on social media, Cyple Journal, on Twitter. I'll share all of our channels um, a little bit later. So we publish both standard and special topics issues. Standard issues are open calls for submissions for all articles in all formats covering any corner of science technology policy. And special topics are sponsored by a partnering organization and focused in scope or topic. Um, in terms of eligibility, as I said, we are very focused on early career students, postdocs, policy fellows, as well as early career researchers and professionals in policy. So today's event um, is linked to one of our special issues uh, that will be published later this year. And uh, we're here today to talk to uh, panelists who are, uh, will talk to us about open science, um, one, of our, one of the topics of this special issue. So uh, just for some background, um, so JSPG, UNESCO, and MGCY launched a call for papers um, earlier this year on open science policies as an accelerator of sustainable development goals. We, um, the deadline is July 10th, and the issue is also sponsored and supported in kind by the outreach partners from the Global Young Academy Working Group on Open Science. And this webinar is the second in a series of events that is meant to help inspire authors and empower them to, to think through um, science policy topics and write about these topics for the issue and improve their submissions to the issue. Previously, we held a writing workshop, uh, which you can watch on our YouTube channel. Um, and this is our first sort of topical discussion on this, on this issue. The special issue, just as a background, again, covers, um, is actually is based on the UNESCO recommendation on open science, which covers a number of areas um, related to designing a more accessible, transparent, and more participatory way of designing, conducting, publishing, and evaluating scholarly research. And we also wanna think about bridging the science, technology and innovation gaps between and within countries, fulfilling the human right to science and leaving no one behind. So with that introduction, this event is the first in a series of webinars. Um, today, we'll talk about setting the stage for open science policy, as well as infrastructures um, and policies related to this topic. Um, so we're also uh, going to talk a little bit about capacity building today and uh, really excited to introduce our panelists and briefly um, introduce the moderator as well. So thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Uh, we're very grateful for everyone's participation and just to briefly introduce them uh, and then turn over to the moderator. So we have Alan Pike, who is a senior policy analyst working on science and technology policies at the OECD. Joanna McIntyre, who is an associate director for EMBL EBI services. And Masha Chema, who is a policy advisor in the office of the chief science advisor in Canada. 
And uh, with that, I'd just like to introduce our moderator today and then turn it over to you. So Paula Kira Masuzo is a full-time data scientist at TP Vision. She's an independent researcher at IGDOR, and among her interests in open science include equitable open access and fair data. She's also interested in developing open educational resources. And she has worked on values that need to drive the global transition to open science, some of which we will also discuss today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paula um, to take it away for our panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Um, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning. That will depend on where you're uh, uh, joining us from. Um, I am very grateful to be here today. I feel honored uh, to lead uh, and to moderate such a discussion, which uh, seems to be very ambitious. If we hear what Adriana is saying, uh, we should be talking for the next six hours, but we don't have that much time, so we'll try to make the best out of it. Um, I would like to start again uh, by saying that indeed we are, as Adriana was mentioning, at a very crucial point in the transition to open science and open research practices. And uh, uh, the, the, the recommendation from UNESCO on open science uh, has clearly shown this uh, as the, the very first uh, um, global and normative instrument uh, and a common understanding and definition of open science. And for the first time, it does not only highlight what are the guiding principles, but also what are the core values uh, uh, that need to justify and to support uh, um, such a transition. Um, I would like to welcome everybody, of course, uh, um, particularly um, our three panelists today. I will briefly introduce them again, but then I will leave the uh, word to them. I have here, of course, your very long biography for each of you, uh, but I think it would be more interesting for me and also for our audience uh, if you uh, told us uh, what you're going to bring uh, to this very interesting table today. I will start uh, with no special order, but let me start from Joanna McIntyre. She goes by Jo, so I will call her Jo, <laughs> um, who's a senior uh, um, scientist and also the associate director of the uh, EMBL um, EBI services, so the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, she's uh, very much uh, working for uh, uh, open access uh, and especially um, linking the uh, different research ob objects on the web. Her team runs the uh, P PMC, if you know, uh, if you work in the life sciences, for sure you know PMC, big database containing uh, um, research objects on the web. Um, and she's very much involved with uh, uh, developing and researching new uh, ways to uh, not only have access to this research information, but also to integrate research information in the 21st century. She has a PhD in plant biology. Uh, I will then uh, um, go to Masha, Masha Chemma, um, who uh, is uh, uh, the um, uh, policy analysis. She's a policy analysis analyst in the office of the chief uh, science advisor for Can of Canada. So we are going from uh, one side of the world really to another one. Um, of course, uh, her, her, her focus will be um, on Canada, but she also uh, keeps an eye out for uh, all the overall trends that are happening in the world around open science and open science transitions. And uh, she has highlighted uh, four very important themes, uh, which are open access, fair data, infrastructure, and culture change. And I think we'll be touch upon uh, um, a little bit of this during our conversation today. And last but not least, uh, Alan Pike, uh, uh, a senior policy analyst, uh, um, uh, um, that works at the Organization for the Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, um, where he's in charge of various aspects of uh, uh, science and innovation policy, um, open access to data for science, technology, and innovation. Uh, with a PhD in particle physics, while, if I remember correctly, Masha has a PhD in microbiology. I hope that is correct. That is correct. So um, I will start maybe from Alan, if you can say just a couple of words of what your expertise with respect to indeed open science and uh, international uh, um, policies is that you bring it today to us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, um, well, I'm uh, at, the, at the OECD. I'm in charge of um, the open science um, uh, item and uh, our most uh, recent achievements in 2021 are the uh, adoption of two um, international legal instruments at the OECD, which uh, have been signed by 41 countries. 
Um, and uh, so this is a, uh, a legal instrument which is not as binding as a treaty, but it is it is an OECD recommendation. So it is a political commitment by 41 countries to, to follow certain principles. And these principles have been, um, a first version of these principles has already been um, adopted in 2006. So OECD has been spearheading this movement uh, towards open science already in 2006. Um, there was uh, very few people talking about uh, open data and open science uh, back in that period. And now we have refreshed this. We have updated the, these, uh, this recommendation in 2021. And then there is another recommendation so there, this is a recommendation specifically on research data. And then we have also a, a second recommendation, which is broader about enhancing access and sharing of um, all types of data, including private data and, and uh, broader uh, public sector uh, data. So, so this, is, uh, this has been uh, my area of, um, of work. Um, I have also worked on, uh, on the contribution of open science to the COVID uh, crisis and um, uh, and I have also written a blog about uh, how the open science um, is actually contributing to um, uh, uh, the uh, societal challenges. Great. Um, I pass then the word. Thank you so much, Alan, to Joe, maybe. Hi, yes, good. Good day to everybody, wherever you are. Um, Yes, yeah, so I am now the Associate Director for Services at the EBI, which means that um, the department I'm responsible for runs um, databases for open data in the life sciences. So this is everything from uh, DNA sequence data, which may include, for example, you know, um, SARS-CoV-2 viral sequences, but of course includes sequences from anything, any bug, any organism that you can think of um, is in the European Nucleotide Archive, and these are international collaborations usually that uh, that make these databases work on a global scale. Pr uh, prior to that, I did run the EuropeMC database, which is all about open access articles. So, you know, open access to the results of research are really close to my heart. And as a result, um, quite recently, um, about a year or two ago, I was asked to co-chair a group at EMBL uh, on um, open science policy development for the Institute. Now, EMBL is uh, an inter intergovernmental organization uh, with six sites uh, in Europe, two in Germany, one in France, one in Spain, one in Italy, and one in the UK, which is where I'm based. Um, and, you know, we run, we do research, but we also run these services, data services, but also uh, physical infrastructures um, to, for, uh, you know, microscopy, structural biology, and things like that. Um, so we have, and we have a very um, important training mission and an, a mission to um, integrate with industry as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that's my latest contribution is to come up with this open science policy, which I can tell you how we did that. We did it in the most consultative way because we needed to bring people with us. Um, and that policy is now um, uh, active as of January 2022. So that's where I'm Very coming fresh. From. Very fresh. Very fresh yeah. policy. Yeah, great. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. And Masha? Hi, everyone. A pleasure to be here. Um, I'm probably on the younger side of the panelists. I finished my PhD five years ago and uh, joined uh, Canadian federal government through a science policy fellowship uh, right about the time when the Canadian government established the role of the Canada's chief science advisor. So at the time I interviewed for one of the supporting positions, you know, the team that would support um, this role uh, and joined right as the office kind of got started. So four years ago. So for the last four years, my role was really to support um, Canada's chief science advisor. Her, um, the main kind of one of the top lines in her mandate is um, to provide advice on making government science available to the public. Um, and uh, she's an ardent champion of open science. So over the last four years, I've kind of conducted more or less kind of environmental scan what's happening with the um, science that's happening in the Canadian government, uh, in the academic institutions internationally. And then um, we work together to create a roadmap for open science uh, for Canadian government science specifically, but with a link to the universe science that's happening uh, in the academia as well. 
And um, I hope to bring a perspective of a you know, young researcher and try to kind of pitch some ideas for people on the, on, in the audience, because I think it's such an exciting um, opportunity you know, to, to think uh, and you know, write and collaborate ideas on open science and how to make it happen in your context and have all these um, amazing you know, workshops and webinars. The first one was really good uh, already um, to help you guide, guide your thinking. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So from what I hear, uh, uh, three different, uh, let's say, environments, uh, um, expertise that it's uh, definitely, uh, that serves the purpose of, of enabling, and not only thinking about open science, but actually enabling uh, um, the open science to become a reality. Um, so all of you have had experiences in, uh, um, not only writing the policies, but also try then to follow up on the implementation and monitoring of these policies, either within uh, your local institutions or, uh, uh, for example, what Joe was saying, uh, um, across different countries uh, um, for uh, um, an institution like uh, one that is indeed uh, uh, bit of a federal uh, organization that needs to keep the different pieces together. So definitely different type of, of challenges. So perhaps uh, um, what I would like to ask as a first question is uh, if there is one key lesson or takeaway that uh, um, you take home uh, at the end of, uh, you know, of, a, of a project for an open science policy uh, within your organization, so what would that be? And I think that Joe has spoiled this a little bit when she was talking about this consultancy type of, of behavior where I guess the policy starts at the bottom rather than uh, at the very top of the chain. And uh, maybe indeed I would like to, to, to start addressing this question to Joe and then we, we go around uh, the table uh, once again. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I, I, I learned actually a lot when we were doing this from the policy um, expert at MBO. And one thing I learned was to be very um, clear about what is policy and what is implementation and try and separate those two out because okay, then with okay. the policy you can be very aspirational you know you can say you can be very bold and you can say you know we expect all the out all the data outputs of uh, research from Emble to be made openly available now of course actually doing that you know is not the same <laughs> thing else. as saying it so, I mean, for some things, it's relatively straightforward. We do have, you know, we're lucky in the life sciences. We have databases that, you know, that are specialists for different data types. So there's, it's, it's reasonable that those data types end up in those databases. But for other things, you know, it's not quite so easy. I mean, you know, very big data, you know, when data sets are terabytes large, you know, it might not be quite so easy to uh, make those data sets available and make them fair and all this kind of thing. So I think that's what I took away. And also you do have to, you know, you do have to take people with you. You do mm -hmm. have to consult, it, you, but, um, but you also have to lead at the same time. I, mean, I think, you know, if you, if you appeal to the lowest common denominator, sometimes your policy wouldn't be as aspirational as it should be. So, but yeah, these practical um, implementations are um, something that can change over time as, as different resources become available, but the policy uh, should be, um, you know, sort of setting the goals, really. And then what you want to do is measure you know, progress against those goals and sort of accept that, you know, it's not going to be 100% compliance overnight, but you want to see the trend towards 100% compliance. And, you know, there are usually some, you know, relatively quick wins that you can do and, um, and, and really focus on. And really, you know, try and focus on the, um, aspects that you, you can impact on rather than going for hundred percent of everything, you know, perhaps for some elements of a policy, 80% would be quite good, you know, this year and, you know, hopefully next year it will be 90%. So you have to be a little bit, um, you know, firm, but human, I would say, but understanding, but uh, clear about the aspirations. Seems to me that what you're saying, uh, it's also what happens uh, within uh, each person that does research when they want to embrace open science practices. If you're not used to publishing preprints, registering your studies, if you're not used to scout for a journal that is open access and to see what means to de deposit your data, to make them fair, as open as possible, you cannot just, you know, switch a button uh, overnight. These things you take time and... That's right. And you have to have a conversation with people. So, you know, if someone yeah. doesn't, you know, doesn't publish their 
article, you know, CC by, then, you know, we can find them. You know, we have actually now a new office for open science. Actually, that's another really important part of this is to, is mm -hmm. the support. Uh, and we have two dedicated posts now that's going to, that are going to help implement the policy. But yes, they're not the police keep saying we're not the police. You know, we are, you yeah. know, we're there to help and educate really. That's, that's how, the, that's the uh, way we look at it. Great, thanks. I think we're, we're going to go back uh, into the support matter uh, a little bit later in the conversation, especially talking about uh, the resources we need to implement open science and how do we make sure that it's sustainable also in the long term. But so if I hear you right, uh, uh, it's a bit naive, maybe on my side, maybe, perhaps, but I never really thought about uh, keeping uh, this uh, two things in two different compartments. The policy on one side that almost, uh, you know, tries to reach for the moon and implementation that actually takes every single step and tries to see what is achievable and what is measurable. Alan, would you say that this is also the experience uh, um, in your field and within the OECD when uh, um, developing uh, policies for open science and innovation? Yes, uh, well, in the um, you know uh, when we when we started out with the, with this recommendation, we also started uh, with that broad consultation. We asked uh, we asked our member countries, the member countries of the OECD, um, about their policies um, on on open data and open science, and uh, and from this broad consultation, we came up with uh, with a number of uh, of issues, and actually we we understood you know everybody's talking about fair data. Um, and that is that is fair, <laughs> um, but you know it's um, I would say it's just uh, just the, the the tip of the iceberg because it's uh, it's treating on the very technical issues about is data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. That's fine. That's basically the result you're aiming for. Uh, but there's so much more about it um, to make it really happen. Uh, okay, and we we found so so in in our recommendation we have seven pillars, and uh, and we found that the first pillar is basically about trust. Okay, uh, you cannot you cannot have open data without uh, a minimum of trust. Uh, we know how wary people are. There there have been high profile data breaches and so on. People are concerned. Um, scientists sometimes use personal data. Uh, people are concerned about privacy and, um, you know, uh, private data being exposed to the public and, and so on. So um, they want to know that uh, their their privacy is being respected and so on. There's sometimes private sector interests. There's sometimes even national security um, issues linked to some some data sets and so on. So um, when you make data open, uh, it is never a zero risk uh, kind of. Um, um, uh, uh, um, type of, of implementation. So there's always mm -hmm. something involved, and you have to you have to make uh, sure that uh, this risk is openly treated, openly communicated. Uh, there's some mitigation and risk management uh, measures. So that's that's the alpha and omega of everything. Then um, you have some behavioral aspects, which are incentives and rewards. Okay. Um, if you ask the um, researchers to share their data and to make their, their uh, data open, um, this, is, this means additional work for them, it's, uh, some, some risk for them, some personal risk, because, uh, you know, if, um, if they did a, a mistake in their, in, their, in their analysis, well, you know, making the data open will, will make it open to, to any other uh, a researcher to to actually point to that mistake, so there there is some reputational risk also in it, and um, and the incentives and rewards are not necessarily always uh, re, uh, always aligned. So the, the the researchers may not have the right um, incentive to you know they're they're running a risk. There it's an additional work, and they're not even recognized because because their their um, you know <laughs> their evaluation is is on on papers. It's not on on, on how many data sets they 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 put out in the open. So there's that problem. Then there is also responsibility, ownership, and stewardship. There's issues around intellectual property and so on. Some people want to keep the data for, for themselves to be able to exploit it um, and, and, uh, and reap, reap the rewards. Um, you have issues with uh, sustainable infrastructures because uh, making data open um, it costs money, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, to, you have to pay for it. And, and the expectation is that 
data should be for free because uh, people will tell you, oh, but you know, this is public, uh, this is public research. So, um, so we cannot pay, we're not supposed to pay for that. Um, and that's a fair point, but, uh, but someone has to pay for the repository, for the curation and so on. Making data open is costly. And the question is who, who pays for it? And, and especially in the long term, you will find, you will find very often short term um, financing, which lasts for a year or two or three years, but then the project is over. And what happens to the data sets? Who, who maintains it? Who, uh, who makes sure that it's available over, over the long term? Okay. Then you have the human capital issues, you have skills issues, um, and that's linked to the trust. Will I trust my data with somebody if I don't trust they have uh, the right skills to protect my data? Okay, so and you have at different at different levels. You need to have the the researchers themselves need to have skills to to manage the data and so on to curate the data. But they don't necessarily have those skills for data management. You have to have the 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 data stewards. They have to have the skills and the latest standards and 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 be able to to protect the data and curate and and, and guarantee the quality over time and then you have the the skills with the users the users need to be able to interpret that data and not you know do fake news with 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 data and finally there is international cooperation there is cooperation across borders you have sensitive data okay sensitive data sets which in some countries might be open to researchers okay you can have special specific setups would say, okay, these kinds of data sets are sensitive, so we don't open it to anyone. We will open them to certified researchers for certified purposes, okay? Uh, and this usually works well in national context, but it doesn't work in international context. Even we, for instance, OECD, we have some trouble. Sometimes we need to exploit some sensitive data sets, and even some of the OECD member countries will not allow us <laughs> to use those sensitive data sets. If we're sitting in Paris, we're not able to access uh, a data which is in a different country. So, so you have all these issues and it's a very, very rich and complex area. Yeah, it is complex. Uh, it's uh, definitely still uh, worth it. Um, I think uh, everybody agrees on this panel and in this audience yeah. that it's definitely still worth it, but it's, Definitely a lot of effort. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Masha, would you like to add something to this? Um, but your experience in developing uh, uh, national policies around open open science. Absolutely, this was a very substantive discussion. I am going to echo Joe's point around uh, aspirational policy sometimes being aspirational. Though a month ago we had a journalist reach out to our office saying, "Oh, how come this deadline is not 100% open access papers? You know, it's not reached yet. It's supposed to be now." And uh, it, it was an aspirational policy, you know, policy. So there's a bit of tension there. But uh, I just want to highlight, you know, the roadmap for open science that I was saying that our office has created. Since there's no slide, here's the document. Uh, something I think might be useful for the audience to to kind of be aware is how this document came about, and uh, I think that's a good lesson. So um, the our office, the Chief Science Advisor of Canada, actually um, recruited um, the one of the top librarians in Canada to lead this work. Libra libraries and librarians are actually very important stakeholders and players uh, in, in open science. And uh, she has assembled an advisory committee that consisted of very like, respected and senior people in science, but also in IT, in the Canadian government, and also uh, in the university sector, including um, you know, the president of the Royal Society of Canada and um, a senior a president of um, an organization that represents top 15 universities and together they have agreed on principles and values that would guide this work and suggested recommendation. So this kind of um, collaborative approach and you know having the right people at the table who have um, the respect of the community, I think that's an important um, consideration, something maybe I would like to share uh, with the group here. Uh, given the other contributions were also really, really rich in insight. Thank you. That's great, Masha. Thanks. It actually brings me uh, almost so smoothly, perfectly to my next point, because what I always struggle with uh, when um, thinking about how to make open science a reality, and if you go back and you look, I guess everybody here has read the recommendations uh, um, of the UNESCO on open science. One of the things that is stressed all over again is that it's true we need to achieve open science needs to be global. 
uh, if we want to actually meet those uh, sustainable goals, if we want to be able to meet the challenges of the future, and I must say the ones of the present, before the, one, the ones of the future, um, we need to make sure that there are as few barriers as possible uh, to enable this uh, global way of, of doing research and um, accumulating knowledge and, and become better and build a better society. Um, however, the diversity um, of the ways in which people do their research, the diversities of, of the cultural diversities, um, even across disciplines, um, within IGDOR, IGDOR is the institute that, I, that, I, that I'm affiliated with, um, uh, we have researchers from very, very different disciplines. And what open science means to somebody in the life sciences is not always this aligning with what open science means to somebody in the humanities. Most of the times is not, I can tell you from my personal experience at least. So perhaps here a question uh, both for uh, Joe, maybe and Alan, maybe Joe, you can, uh, you can uh, start if you want. Uh, the question would be, how can we go towards this global understanding, common understanding of open science uh, while preserving the diversity of the communities? Even when I think about the languages, the fact that right now we are all speaking English because that's the only way we can understand each other, but yet there's so much in the national languages and the literature, the scientific literature written in the national languages that we might lose if we focus only on English. So how can we preserve this richness while working on a common understanding of, of open scholarship? Well, yeah, that's a tough question, isn't it? I mean, I know. It's, the holy, it's the holy grail if we can do that when we've won. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, some of the points that Alan raised, I think, you know, you have to sort of try and recognise what, what is international okay. and what is um, of national interest, potentially, and, and weigh those two things up. Um, I mean, definitely, for example, with, um, you know, human identifiable data, you know, clinical data, you know, that is of national interest and, you know, and subject to national, you know, the jurisdiction in which it was generated and so on. And there's the trust issues there, of course, as well. But for some things like, you know, investigating rare diseases, you know, you really do want to access that data internationally mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you may only, because if a disease is very rare, there might only be two or three instances in a country. So you really want to look at, a, you know, broaden the pool. Now to do that, yes, takes a lot of trust and it takes a lot of infrastructure um, and standards and community buy-in to figure out how to how that data can be shared um, in an equitable and safe way. And, it's, and there are organizations that do think about this kind of thing. Um, I mean, the GA4GH organization, for example, is an international effort that you know, really pulls in many, many, many projects that both generate and want to use this kind of data to try and find standards and safe ways of sharing this data in a in a in a in a equitable way. So I haven't got a very good answer, but I do think you know all all politics starts at home, and I think you know starting with your local um, situation, I think will help drive you know the more international. Um, agendas and you know everyone can learn from doing things in their own context um, and then having the, the the means to bring together people and share that learning I think that's that's the only way forward and when we can do that we can you know we can understand the commonalities potentially and then build more international structures as well but it, it really is a global effort uh, that that's required here great Thanks. I know it was a tough question, but I think this can also perhaps add a little piece to the puzzle that our audience will try to maybe construct or build when thinking about submitting their pieces to the journal. So one thing would be aspirational implementations versus actually the policy, and the other would be interest of to whom um, locally, national, international. Um, all these are very important factors. Um, Alan, do you want to, to, to add something to this to this component, especially in terms of the, you have already touched upon it a bit earlier, in terms of these social cultural differences. How, how do you keep this, how do you keep in mind or how do you make sure that these are, you know, preserved while working uh, to unify actually across different nationalities and, and, and countries. 
Yeah, um, actually there are, um, it was not the focus of, of our recommendation, but there are there is a set of principles which is called the care principles, uh, which, is, which is about um, maintaining also the data sets and the, the ownership of data sets. Um, I don't know, you probably know about uh, the, uh, the very uh, negative um, example, which was uh, around the Ebola um, mm -hmm. data, right? Which, yeah. uh, which originated in, in some um, emerging countries and then um, suddenly the data sets were transferred to the, uh, uh, to the in global north and, um, and this somehow dispossessed the global south of their own data. Um, and um, and I think there is a, there is a specific set of principles which is um, taking care that this kind of um, um, uh, thing does not happen again. Um, there is uh, there are very sensitive um, examples such as, um, for instance, the collection of data, especially in the health domain. Um, in, in emerging countries. And then the idea is that uh, you are aggravating the digital divide because um, um, whoever is better equipped to actually exploit the data. So you say, okay, let's make the data open, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but then, so the, the emerging country who has the data is told to, to, uh, to make the data open for free and then, and then there will be, uh, you know, perhaps a vaccine or a, or a, or a medical uh, uh, treatment or something like that. And then the, the global north will process that data. They have, uh, you know, much more uh, analytical power to actually uh, transform this data into useful knowledge. And then they will come back to the global south, and they will sell the vaccine or the <laughs> or the drugs back, right? So, so it's it's uh, some sort of uh, uh, neo colonialism, <laughs> if you if you wish. All right? So, so we have to be very sensitive to these kinds of um, issues. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned you mentioned languages, of course. You know, languages are an issue, and uh, it's in general in science. Um, uh, most uh, most scientists uh, around the world who want to have an impact are, are more or less uh, have a pressure to to publish in English. I think that probably over time um, it might be that uh, that this this kind of pressure will will ease because uh, with the development of machine translation, which is now extremely good, um, um, you know, you, and and an exploitation of data also which is done by artificial intelligence uh, you could imagine that uh, in the future um, you know it, it it might be more feasible that uh, basically publications and data could be uh, published in, in the different and diverse languages and i think uh, clearly we do lose uh, some of our diversity especially i would say probably mostly in the social sciences uh, uh, diversity is lost if, if everybody has to write and, and speak in language, right? Uh, but then, then you also have other aspects, not only language. You have uh, cultural aspects, as you said, um, and and also in this uh, in the component of trust, as I said, um, you know, we have different uh, conceptions of trust and different ethical stances in different cultures, you know. Mm -hmm. Take, for instance, uh, facial recognition. You know, in some countries, uh, in some some cultures, it is totally acceptable that uh, the government has a database with, uh, you know, Absolutely. faces of of the citizens. Of and that course, the citizens. In other cultures, it is totally unacceptable, and um, and clearly, we have to take uh, into account this kind of diversity also about, uh, you know. What we what we understand and under trust and and what is the what is the privacy and you know and in the in the other in the other extreme you know I have heard also leukemia uh, patient associations telling me that uh, you know basically GDPR GDPR is there to protect personal privacy but some leukemia pa patients are saying you know but GDPR is actually um, creating new barriers to to leukemia research because uh, you know we leukemia patients we're we're happy to share our 
or all our personal data. We don't care about personal data. We, we want science to go, go ahead, you know? So, so these are all delicate balances, which, you know, across different cultures, different stakeholders. And I think and the only way we can uh, go around it is to have, a, to maintain a, an open and transparent di dialogue with, with all the stakeholders and, uh, and uh, try to, to, to find common ground. Great. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, These Alan. were uh, really, really interesting points. Um, Masha, would you like to add something? Um, if not, I have a question for you, but uh, feel free to chip in. You're, you're muted, though. I yes. think that was a very extensive que uh, answer, so I am happy to take a new question. Okay, great. Because um, one of the things that I'm also thinking we should talk at a certain point is uh, we want open science to function, we want it to function well, but uh, somebody needs to pay for it. Um, we need to transition also in terms of infrastructure. So sometimes I think about how we still publish papers um, in 2022, uh, which unfortunately still resembles the way we did it 30, 40, 50, even more years ago. And that seems a little bit stupid if you ask me, um, given that there is way more uh, uh, than PDF to, to research objects. And Joe especially might agree with this, right? When you look into what a research uh, experiment produces, all these digital objects that you can actually put on the web and link to each other and enhance discovery, text mining and data mining. Um, some things unfortunately are still uh, um, there because researchers feel pressured into publish. Uh, some things are starting to transition. This also means that we need to uh, be able to come up with sustainable ways of having uh, research infrastructures up and running and uh, sustainable open access. I argue if uh, the APC model uh, is the most equitable or sustainable open access in the long term, so long question, short, uh, how can we make sure that we can actually do open science? Uh, uh, who's going to pay for it? Also in terms of human or human capacity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do researchers need to be able to do everything there is to do in the 21st century science? Well, this is a very big question. So I think I'm going to maybe start with the um, capacity and then talk about mm -hmm. maybe um, how to create, um, there's a word that UNESCO used, like a, con a good environment for the open science policy Absolutely. To, to flourish. So uh, in terms of um, capacity um, and uh, skills that people have, uh, we recently held uh, dialogues with Canadian researchers in all uh, disciplines we could you know, think of. And it, that was identified as a big gap, both in terms of knowledge of publishing in the open, but obviously as well in data, it's an even bigger gap or discrepancy, I guess, between skills from uh, knowing, uh, you know, what a high quality data and metadata is to um, knowing the solutions for storage, um, et cetera. So I think there is a big, um, big gap. How do we um, foster that um, even desire and, and, and how to build these skills? Uh, if there's policies that could make that happen, um, you know, I think that uh, this can start early at undergraduate level and it happens in some places and it's more of this uh, bottom up kind of incentive when they're enthusiastic researchers that find the way to to teach that and undergraduate at graduate level that happens i know here in canada the, um, there's an under, undergraduate course um, that en encompasses open science at ubc and they have a kind of more wide-ranging program there and it was a collaboration between a researcher and a librarian and they got some funding from the university to do that and scale that up so those are some pockets of opportunities um, so I think funding is needed for this skills and training and um, uh, probably the best uh, friends are you know, researchers who are enthusiastic and knowledgeable about open science, but also librarians and libraries and library associations also have that skills uh, because it's, it's not really useful they have to have the policies in place uh, and the infrastructure and people not being able to use them. Uh, now, in terms of the fostering the environment for open science policy, it, it is expensive. And 
I don't think from the political perspective, it's a big win unless the researchers are enthusiastic about it. Um, we're talking about disciplinary diversity and um, there's still a lot of researchers who are not excited about it. So um, there's this kind of potential for backlash uh, for a strict open science policy. So, you know, I think kind of to get to that more positive en environment um, where this would happen, you kind of need to know that there's some support, uh, especially from the young researchers, um, you know, the skill set. Uh, and then, you know, it's easier uh, to convince and also like convincing the public, you know, because there's a lot of, um, it, it happens that um, patients read, try to read papers about their disease and unable to access it because it's behind paywall or there's other kind of reasons uh, why, um, why citizens need access uh, to, to publications and data or like small startups um, also need access to, to data and, and publications and kind of that understanding at, and vocal presence you know, of those who want that to happen. Would make it a much easier sell um, for for the investment, and then in terms of the sustainability, um, I think sustainability really comes uh, hand in hand with culture change. You know, how do we publish? It's because it's incentivized this way. So, what are the incentives and um, how this can be addressed? This would be my short uh, answer to your big question. I'm sure others Thanks. would add to it. Thanks, Masha. Um, I pick up from here and I ask Joe a, a very straight, honest question. As your institution signed the DORA Declaration on uh, Open Research Assessment and Evaluation, and if so, has there been uh, an actual implementation of those shifts of rewards and assessment of the researchers? Well, well, the, the straight answer is yes, we have signed that declaration. And actually, this morning we were in one of our, we had a workshop uh, where we engaged uh, different parts of the Institute, different roles, different career stages um, in a workshop on um, how we should, one aspect of our DORA implementation, which is, um, you know, how we ask for um, information on um, outputs in CVs, mm -hmm. which is the classic place where people, you know, list journal names and uh, use impact factors to to shortlist or um, parse out um, the applicants they want to interview and so on. So we are in the process, the, so the bottom line, we are in the process of implementing DORA at EMBL. In fact, we don't, we don't the, because it's quite a young organization in that we're always recruiting students, PhD students, postdoctoral researchers and um, group, you know, new group leaders. And we have a, a rule at EMBL that you can only stay for nine years. So we have a constant yeah. sort of turnover of uh, relatively um, early career stage people. So actually, we do find that we have to quite a lot look look for other things because, of course, you know, uh, someone who's just got a bachelor's degree in general will not have you know, published anything. Uh, and even when you come to do a PhD, uh, sorry, when you come to do a postdoctoral work, you know that you're you're you don't have a long career behind you to to show these things. So. And actually, one of the things that came out of that workshop this morning was that people were very encouraged, I think, to be able to show the other things that they've done. And in particular, if, for example, you're, you're an engineer, um, you know, working on a database or on a piece of equipment, you know, you, there are different ways to show uh, how you've impacted on the generation of scientific knowledge, not, not just publications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are in the process of implementing that. And um, again, it's about getting people from, you know, different constituencies across the organization to to come together and, and find a, a common solution um yeah so great thanks it, 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 the incentives do go hand in hand with open science that's a that's a fact i mean the the funding agencies you know and they are shifting slowly um in general um going to reward other things reward outputs other than papers and yeah. certainly papers in a small number of journals I've seen that uh, along the years as well. When I um, first uh, started, um, let's say I fell in love with uh, open research practices. I was still doing my PhD. And um, at a certain point, I was surprised that all the advocacy of, of, of open science champions or people saying, yeah, we need to do open science. Nobody was actually explicitly saying, uh, 
you know, we need to reward people on their open science practices. That was, of course, many years ago. Um, I look young, but I'm not that young. And, um, <laughs> and but now I must say the conversation is shifting. It, it has to shift because uh, this cannot happen without empowering uh, this, uh, this, uh, the researchers and uh, without shifting also the way we tell them uh, Good job, you know, <laughs> that good job we cannot be on the high impact factor that per se doesn't mean much about how relevant the research is. The good job should be on research integrity, on transparency, on uh, um, collaborative work and all the things that, you know, are those factors within the big open science equation. And this is this is happening. I personally believe it could be happening a bit faster yeah. um, because we don't have that much time to waste behind uh, chasing the impact factor anymore. Um, the COVID pandemic for one has, has shown this very has, clearly. I think you're right. I think that has really sharpened the focus on the need to um, share information quickly and reliably. Absolutely. Of course, what it has happened is a bit of a what I call an, an emergency open science, right? When you don't know what else to do, and you are in, you, en you enter this panic mode where we were all in panic. We still are somehow, and we were trying to find, uh, you know, a cure, what the disease means, and so on and so forth. But that's that's pulling an emergency open access, and it should not be the case. This should become part of really a transformative way of of doing research. Um, I believe that, uh, thank you so much, Joe. I wanted to ask, uh, to go back to Alan for a moment, because um, I think that I interrupted a little bit the, the train there of, of our conversation, but simply because I wanted to link these two things from Masha and Joe around, uh, um, you know, the young generation of scientists and how they are rewarded. But another thing that I wanted to ask Alan is, uh, um, given your experience and your, your work uh, and your expertise at the OECD uh, developing international also open science policies, do you believe that um, funders, uh, um, let's say internationally, are convinced that investment should be uh, in open science efforts? Or is there still resistance and some work to be done? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I would just, uh, the previous speaker said um, uh, open science is costly. Yes, it's true, it's costly, but I think it's even more costly not to have open science. Because um, the cost of not having open science is um, uh, resulting then very often in duplication of uh, research efforts. Okay, if you don't have, uh, uh, for instance, you have this problem of the of the negative uh, negative results, right? If somebody does research and uh, uh, this research uh, is uh, does not does not come up uh, with uh, anything useful, which is able. Which you could be publishing, then basically um, the the knowledge about um, you know we went up this alley, we tried it, it doesn't work. Um, nobody knows about it, right? So you will have other researchers in other countries um, asking for additional public funding to uh, go down the blind alley again and again. Okay, uh, so. Uh, this kind of thing, then you have reproducibility issues, right? When you're trying to um, check some research, whether you know the 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 results are are okay or not. And we're doing this in science all the time. I'm also previously I was a, a scientist, as you mentioned, I'm in particle physics. So so we we repeat experiments to uh, to check whether whether you know a uh, finding is is correct. Uh, if we had the data sets, uh, maybe we would not need to uh, repeat the experiment. Maybe we would just repeat the calculations on the on the existing data set. So, so reproducibility um, is is there. Uh, availability also for the for the entrepreneurs for the private sector to to use the scientific data to be able to innovate, create new products and services. This is also. Um, a growth engine and so on. So there were several studies which were commissioned that the um, European Commission uh, commissioned several studies and, and uh, one of the most recent studies from uh, which was done by PwC, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers in 2019 showed that um, uh, the cost of not having fair research data in the European Union alone is, uh, is costing the European Union 10 billion euros annually, 
Okay. Yeah. Um, um, there were some other um, uh, um, studies which showed that if you broaden it to more general public se sector information, not only research data, that you can actually go up to 140 billion euros, which which represents uh, you know more than one percent of the gross domestic product of the EU. So you, we're talking about huge money, which is lost because we don't we do not have open open data and when you when you look at individual uh, there was a study in australia which showed that uh, uh, the um, commonwealth scientific and the industrial research organization data access portal uh, uh, they estimated benefits at 67 million australian dollars annually just for one one data access portal which is which is you know 20 times the cost, what it costs to set up that, that portal. So yes, it does cost a lot of money, but the benefits are, you know, huge compared to that. So it is an investment. And yes, we do see funders uh, requiring this now. Um, it is very often a condition. Uh, you will get the grant if uh, and only if you can uh, show that your data will be uh, openly and freely uh, accessible. Uh, there is even some people who are advocating that there should be a rule of thumb uh, that 5% uh, of each research grant should be actually dedicated to making the, the data open. Of course, it's just a rule of thumb. There, there can be, there can be um, uh, depending on the project and the, uh, the, the amount of data generated, of um, it can be more or less. But as a rule of, of thumb, 5% of, of each research uh, grant should be uh, should be um, uh, dedicated to making the data sustainably open. Great. So basically, um, it is indeed an investment. It's complex. It requires time. It requires efforts. It requires yeah money, like every every everything we do. Bottom line, um, but we, we there is no much more convincing to be done. I think everybody uh, is on the same page that it is time we actually make uh, science open by by default. Thanks, Alan. A great answer. Um, and I would I wanted actually to say that most of the points that you raise are also part of this uh, terrific book I'm reading uh, uh, by Stuart Ritchie. It's called Science Fictions. And amongst other things, what it shows is that indeed, when we do not open the data and methods behind the research uh, project, uh, the cost that we end up, um, you know, uh, having to pay, and that actually we pay, it's uh, much higher than when we actually do research in the open and with uh, transparent uh, methodologies. Um, I think that um, unfortunately, uh, Joe had to leave. Uh, so yeah, she's in, she's uh, not uh, uh, in the panel anymore. But we have a couple of questions uh, uh, from the audience, and I will uh, take them now. Um, maybe the first one uh, is more for uh, for Masha, um, if you want. Uh, somebody is saying that we always say that it's the young researchers that have to make the change. Um, however, these researchers are evaluated by the seniors. Uh, seniors uh, keep on, uh, you know, deciding uh, what is more important to be evaluated. The university pursue rankings. Um, unethical companies continue to sell the open system and its rankings. And I have to agree with this. We have played the the, the game of the journal uh, of the journals for way too long. Um, they have all the power now in their hands. How to involve these young researchers? in the decisions that our institutions are making, how to make them informed at the office, at the access offices, at the library, where to direct them. So not only how we can empower these young researchers to do open science, but actually to be part of the, you know, to sit at the table where the decisions are made. Yeah. It's a great, that's a great question, question, I think. That's a great question. And I also just wanted to point out to participants that an interesting uh, thing to investigate is university rankings, you know, and what goes into university rankings and how that impacts the whole system and, and the incentives that are then kind of trickled down. So, uh, I mean, I agree that um, the system has to change altogether, not just by early researchers, but what can you do as an early researcher to uh, put your perspective forward? Uh, I think actually being here is a great place to start uh, submitting a paper um, you know, by July 10 uh, on open science, uh, finding like-minded people 
uh, you know, here in this group or in your institution and making start to make your voice heard. I think that's a really excellent start. And there are, um, you know, one of the sponsors of this uh, is the Global Young Academy that have an open science working group. That's also, you know, a great place for this. But um, ultimately, I think starting at your local institution and finding like minded people, including like mentors, older, older people who are also uh, on your side and and uh, thinking about it carefully in a nuanced way uh, and putting some practical solutions uh, out there, as well as, you know, um, maybe uh, we talked earlier about uh, building skills um, broadly and, and awareness. So I, I think that's really um, the way to go. Because as a policy advisor, kind of, I look, uh, like I read reports, uh, I look at papers that come out, I have a Google alert on open science, I see what's published, I, I see like the open science uh, hashtag, you know, so make your voice heard. And if you're, um, something that you are producing is thoughtful and thorough, then um, that will attract attention. That's great, thanks. Um, I think a question uh, very close by um, also asks, uh, how can we make sure that we do this without jeopardizing our career? Um, and I don't know, Masha, if you have something to say in this respect, but when I do advocate for open science, I always tell researchers, especially the early career ones, that you know their safety and what is good for them comes before anything else. So you take every little step that you, that you can, um, you control and you, you know, you lead what you what you have a voice on and what you simply need to accept because this is what your institution is demanding on you. This is because you what your supervisor is expecting of you, and that's the only way for you to actually live, uh, you know, still safe within your research environment. And then you should also compromise to some extent. Um, what has helped me in the past and still helps me is indeed to build alliances. If you look around, there are people in your same situation, people that want to, to do more open science but don't know how to um, team up. I think that that is an answer to, to a lot of, of, of worries in this respect. I don't know if Masha, if you agree with this. Well said. Yeah. All right, great. So guys, uh, team up with each other, look around, be part of the conversation. There are other people uh, who are speaking the same languages and looking for the same reassurances. And maybe something for you then, Alan, somebody is asking uh, again another great question, which is how do you resolve the conflict between open science and intellectual property? It's a very interesting question. Well, um, you know, um, it's, uh, it's something we address in, in, in our recommendation. Um, uh, of course, you have to you have to be very very cautious about that. Um, firstly, there is um, you you cannot you cannot patent data. Okay, that's the first uh, the first premise is you cannot patent data. So if you want to preserve your intellectual property, um, you can um, you can keep your data secret and uh, very very many. Uh, um, you know, um, especially uh, when you're talking about private companies, uh, they will uh, they will tend to keep uh, keep data secret, and um, and uh, of course, um, when you have private sector interests, uh, then uh, then you get this intellectual property issues. Now, in um, when we're talking, we have to segment. Are we talking about uh, private sector or are we talking about? Um, openly, you know, publicly funded research. So the, the, the principle by default for publicly funded research should be, um, you know, taxpayers paid for the, for the research and therefore the, the data should be, should be open and, uh, and available to, to the citizens. Mm -hmm. and, um, unless there is a very good reason, uh, of course, there's, uh, there's uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there can be very good reasons why you cannot um, make data openly available. If it's uh, privacy issues, if it's uh, national security issues, if it's uh, even you know uh, things like uh, data about endangered species, you know, to 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 publish uh, the list of um, 
the last uh, uh, known rhinoceroses on, on Earth would be very dangerous, right? Because you would, you would have clearly some people who are uh, ill-intentioned and uh, who would uh, use that for the wrong uh, purposes. Um, so so uh, clearly they, there can be reasons why you have to limit um, access to, to data. Now, um, as I said, intellectual property is, is um, is totally legitimate, and, and this is something which drives innovation in the private sector, provides the right incentives, right? So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're segmenting between those two uh, segments, and we're saying that, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of issues should be uh, limited to uh, when uh, research is, is um, and then, you, of course, you then you have the, the, the special cases uh, when you have public-private partnerships, uh, then you have to see which part has to be um, protected by intellectual property and uh, which other part can be made open. And it's it's clear that there is some tension there. There is some tension there. Uh, but you know, even private companies very often um, see that it is in their best interest to to share some data. I will, uh, for instance, I can provide you an example. During the the COVID pandemic. You have the telecommunications and uh, and uh, and internet providers who have shared data about mobility, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and this was very useful to actually um, monitor the um, the efficiency of uh, the lockdown measures. So you were you were able to see you know uh, how how much the mobility of people has decreased. Mm -hmm. and, Given countries, and you could actually compare that the way it was quite different in different countries. Um, so, so very often, um, even private companies will will uh, choose to open up their data sets um, and uh, and contribute to the com community um, in a, in a positive way. And and there has been also a, a private sector initiative during the COVID initiative, uh, which. Um, which said that you know um, data would be uh, uh, shared and even software would be shared, which can be used for for, for the pandemic uh, for fighting the pandemic and finding that. Um, so so you know there on a case by case basis uh, these things are are being uh, managed well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. I think there is also this uh, misconception a bit that uh, open, open science or open access should necessarily mean that you give away everything for free and everything belongs to everybody. This is this is not why we would like to, to enable and to have this, this transformation, right? Um, open science can create value and sometimes this value can be intellectual and can be, can be reflected in um, um, monetary value, if we want, and, and innovation and technology. Um, we have um, a couple of, of more uh, of questions still. Um, they are uh, very similar to each other, and I believe they are more actually comments rather than questions. Um, the first one says that uh, there is a big bias in judging the quality and importance of the work. Um, it depends on the discipline. An impact factor can be sometimes a two without the, the APC. Sometimes uh, if you publish instead in another journal, it can be more than five for a basic review and you have to pay for the APC. So the quality of the publication should stay with the relevance to society and not with the numbers. This is a little bit what we were saying before. We've played this game of the impact factor for, for way too long. And another one uh, um, that is close by says that uh, publication through the APC in journals with impact factor by author and then opening acts for the for the readers. So the, the actually where you, um, where you actually pay the, the fee indeed so that the reader has access to, to the paper. Um, it has becoming a new trend and it looks to me like a new business. We could argue, and I, I would tend to agree that this is indeed um, another way to look at uh, open access, uh, definitely not the most sustainable or not the most uh, um, equitable. Um, somebody also says that there is definitely a need to have collaborations and involvement of people who are currently involved in interested and interested in science policy from around the world. I think this panel has shown this, um, and I think that this is a perfect comment for me to try and draw couple of conclusions. We've talked about many, many things. I am definitely glad that um, this webinar is being recorded so that uh, 
people who are interested can go back and uh, pause and listen again to all the things that we mentioned. I try to write down a few keywords that uh, really um, are going to stay with me, I think. Um, this uh, fact that policies should be aspirational and then it's up to the implementation to actually think about very actionable, little or bigger things that, that we can do, that we can, uh, that can, we, that can we, we can measure. Um, trust, trust uh, kept uh, coming back uh, a lot and I think that this is uh, relevant not only to build uh, uh, open science uh, policies that are sustainable and fair, um, but also to make sure that we gain, uh, um, you know, this, this trust back from society and that we take science and we put it back where it belongs, which is serving society, within society, for society. Uh, we talked about diversity, diversity, different actors uh, um, in the open science uh, uh, conversation, different uh, um, disciplines, um, uh, different parts of the world, different languages. Uh, it's very much uh, um, important to um, protect this diversity uh, while trying to um, uh, act towards a common understanding uh, uh, of open science. Um, something for the audience to think about uh, uh, when they want to write something for, uh, for the submission uh, to the journal is also uh, the interest. So are we talking about something that is interested for a local community, national versus international or a broader scale? And uh, definitely that the, there needs to happen a change also in uh, not only how we do science, but how we evaluate and how we assess uh, the researchers and our research. All in all, I think that out of this dialogue, uh, um, my favorite word would be complexity. It's not an easy task. It's not an easy conversation. It's definitely an important one, one that it's uh, absolutely worth uh, to be having. So I thank you very much again, uh, our panelists, Masha, Alan, and also Joe, who already left. And I think uh, I thank all the audience for all their comments uh, and their uh, uh, questions and for being with us during this uh, small hour. And with this, I think I can uh, give it back to Adriana for her closing remarks. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Paula, uh, and to our panelists today. Uh, that was a great discussion. I, I certainly learned a lot and I'm sure the audience did as well. We really appreciate your insights. Um, and I'd like to thank also our sponsors, UNESCO and GCY and the Global Young Academy Working Group on Open Science for partnering with us on this event and the special issue. Uh, I wanna share again our call for papers and relevant links that you can go to um, to keep up, up to date with what we're doing, the newsletter and YouTube, where we'll post the recordings for all the events. So we encourage you to subscribe to that as well. And I just wanna give you a preview of what's coming up after this um, for our next few events. So as I mentioned, this is the first in this series and a really great introduction um, to the topic. So next we'll have on April 29th, a webinar on developing collaborative governance for open science through public participation and inclusive knowledge. We'll focus on consolidating public participation in open science, engaging societal actors beyond the scientific community and promoting the inclusion of knowledge from traditionally marginalized scholars. After that, on May 20th, we'll have another webinar on incentives, rewards, and evaluation methods, which has come up today, um, around open science in the scientific process, evaluating methods for open science, approaching to incorporate open science at different stages in the scientific process, as well as in policy decisions. And finally, the last webinar in June will take place on June 10th. It will be on fostering international co cooperation, which again, we've touched on today and reducing gaps in access to scientific knowledge through open science with a view towards reducing digital technological and knowledge gaps between and within countries. And so stay tuned for uh, information on this and speakers coming up for the upcoming events. And again, we look forward to seeing your submissions to the special issue. And thank you again for joining today. <laughs>